All right. So the the thing is, um, we are going to continue um, looking at um, the lectures. Um, that means that uh, come Monday, that's when we are going to do the 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 labs. And uh, this week we. Um, we are going to meet only, you know, two times. That is, we met yesterday and today. Uh, come next week, uh, we'll be meeting on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Because I'm sure uh, this week I'll be done with the other training. Okay. Module, module, module 11, Network Communication Devices. Okay. So the main objective of this module is to explain how network devices enable wired and wireless network communication. Okay, so for us to have a network, we must have network devices, okay? And um, we have two types of network devices. The first one is called end devices. These are PCs, uh, servers, and IP phones. We call these end devices. The other type is intermediary devices. So here we have the switch, and then we also have the, the router. So as you can see here, what we have, this is a LAN, a local area network, you know. A local area network, it only covers a smaller geographical area, okay? So we have another local area network somewhere, okay? So if you see the the device that we use to connect end devices is a switch. But when we want to connect this local area network to this other local area network, we use the, we use the routers. Okay. All right, so here we have the video whereby you have read and maybe you didn't understand, you can watch this video here. Okay. Routers. Routers, what are these? These are layer three devices. Okay. Uh, we use them to connect remote sites. So um, what we have here, this is the central office. This is the branch, and maybe we have got someone working at home, okay? To connect to these, we use the routers, okay? And the internet is nothing but the connection of routers, okay? So this is a local area network. Now, the network that we have between these two routers is called a WAN, okay? A wide area network. So between two routers, the network that we have is called a wide area network. So the thing here is that uh, you find that uh, the LAN is maintained by the organization, but the WAN is maintained by carriers. For example, here at Unza, we can open another branch in Kitwe, all right? So when we want to connect that branch, which is in Kitwe, with the Unza here, we must have one router here at Unza and another router uh, in Kitwe. Now, this network between the, the routers is called a wide area network, and it, it is maintained by carriers, for example, um, uh, liquid telecoms and others. Okay. 
All right. Now, the thing is, these routers, they are chatty, they talk. That is, they do exchange information about what they know. So the thing here, what you see is that this PC, it doesn't know how to go to this network. But this router, it is going to share these routes with this router one. That is how this PC can be able to know how to get to this other PC. Okay, so the routers, they exchange about what they know. And the routers, they keep the information in the routing table. Okay, so on the router, when you want to see this routing table, you go to the privileged mode and run a command called show IP route. Okay, all right. Uh, show IP route, okay? So what you have here, these are initials of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, I can say uh, both dynamic and static routes, okay? So when you see a C here, it means connected routes. For example, to this router, this is a connected route, and this is a connected route. Okay? All right. And then, with respect to this router, uh, this network or route is called a remote route. Okay? So S is static route. It means that the, the route was learned statically or, you know, it was configured manually by a network admin. Of course, uh, the network admin is able to do this when the network is very, very small. But when the network is very, very big, this is when now you use dynamic routing protocols. For example, you've seen the D here is for a dynamic routing protocol called EIJRP, okay? Uh, EX, this is EIJRP external, or that is OSPF, okay? So these are just initials to help you understand what is here. So have you seen this network, 192.168.1.0? This is the network, okay? It is direct, directly connected to router one, okay? Have you seen this other network here? 192.168.2.0. You see, this was also, this is also directly attached. But have you seen the S? S is for static route. Okay? Static route. So um, we are on router one. So this here means. Uh, we are here to get to this network, which is 192.168.3.0. We have to pass through 192.168.2.2. So you see, for us to move from here, we have to pass through this interface. Okay. So this is the interface 192.168.2.2. Okay, so this is how you read the routing table. Okay, all right. So uh, in the routing table, this is where the router calculates the best path to use to get to a certain location. Okay. All right. So the thing is, um, um, you know, when the router receives a packet, you know, after the router has determined the exit interface using path determination, the router must encapsulate the packet into the data link frame 
of the outgoing uh, interface. Okay. When a packet received from one network and destined for another network, the router performs these three steps. It what? It decapsulates. It has to open up the two frame header. You know why? Because it it wants to check the layer three uh, packet. It, it it wants to look for or it, it wants to check the IP address. Okay, so it examines the destination IP address of the packet to find the best path in the routing table. Okay, if the router finds a path to the destination, it has to encapsulate the layer three packet into a new layer two frame. So the thing here is we have two routers. Okay, now these two routers already they know the, their MAC addresses. Okay, so when, when the packet is moving from this router to the other router, it means we need to, to change, you know, the destination MAC address because now the destination MAC address will be the, will be the, 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 the MAC address of the next uh, router. Okay, so this is uh, what happens, you know, you are sending something from PC1 to PC2. You know, this is the OSI model. The message has to go down, okay, the OSI model. And then here, the ones and zeros, they have to be changed into signals, okay? When this router receives the packet, we we'll start moving up. So here we, we had encapsulation, we were adding the headers, but here we have decapsulation. So when we are here, we have to open the packet, you know, and look for the MAC address. Okay. So quite all right, the MAC address is the MAC address of this router. Okay. And then we move up to layer three now and look for the IP address. So we're going to find that the IP address is not addressed to this router. Okay. So start going down. Okay. Like that. Okay. So this is what uh, happens. All right. Packet forwarding decision process. Okay. So the, the router, you know, is the one which is supposed to decide, you know, uh, where to forward, you know, the, the packets. So we have these steps here. Um, you know, uh, I, I think I did explain already on this. So the data link frame with an encapsulated IP address, it, it arrives on the egress interface. The router has to examine the destination IP address in the packet header. And then it has to consult the routing table. You know, now in the routing table, this is where we have different routes. Okay, so the router has to find the longest match prefix in the routing table. Right now, the, the, the address with the longest prefix match becomes the best route here. Okay, so uh, the address with the longest MAC address. Okay, the router encapsulates the packet in the data link frame and forward it out to the egress interface. So you see, we have ingress going in into the router and then egress going out of the router okay that's how it works all right so the router performs three main functions okay um the job of the router is to forward the packet 
and also to come up with the best path to use, okay? So the router forwards the packet to a device on a directly connected network. It forwards the packet to, a, to the next hop router, okay, which is the next uh, uh, router, or it can drop the packet. That is when there's no matching in the routing table. Okay, all right. So um, we have the process of forwarding, which varies based on whether we are using an IPv4 or IPv6 packet. When we're using an IPv4 packet, the router checks its ERP table. Remember, we covered the, the, the ERP table yesterday. For the destination IP address and an associated what? MAC address, okay? If there's no match, the router sends an ERP request. And the same device is going to return what? An ERP reply with its MAC address. So you see, very, very important that what you learned in module one, you have to carry you know, with you up to the end of the course. Very, very important. So here we're talking about uh, ERP request and ERP reply, which I did explain uh, yesterday. And everything that we are doing in this course is applicable, you know, uh, 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 anywhere, you know, in your organization, it has to be applied. Okay. The router can now forward the air packet in the Ethernet frame with the proper destination MAC address. You know, I did explain about the air process. For the IPv6 packet, the router checks its neighbor cache for the destination IP address and an associated Ethernet MAC address. If there's no match, the router sends what? You know, it sends a neighbor solicitation message and the design device is going to reply with the neighbor advertisement message with its MAC address. You know, just the same process. The router can now forward the IPv6 packet in the Ethernet frame with the proper destination MAC address. Okay, so uh, this router, it can forward the packet to the next hop router, that is to the next uh, router or it can drop the packet. That is, if there's no match uh, in the routing table. Okay, the routing information, I did explain about this. So the router has the routing table where it keeps what? Directly connected routes. I talked about this. What are these routes? So these are the routes that you know, have you seen, for example, this is called a directly attached route, okay, with respect to this route. So these two, they are called directly connected routes, okay? Now, with respect to this router, these are called remote routes or paths, okay? How this router learn about these remote routes, it is through these two routers. They exchange the information. They exchange the information that they have in the routing table. So this is how this router will be able to reach PC2, okay? So we have, uh, directly connected routes and what? Remote routes. I did explain about remote routes. So the routing table, uh, of course, is a data file in the RAM, okay? And uh, you know that uh, RAM is volatile, meaning that uh, when you switch off the, 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 the router, it means that anything that, that we have in the routing table is also going to is also going to go. Okay, 
So the routing table also contains uh, networks, next hop associations, okay? It also has what is called the outgoing or the exit interface to the next destination. Okay, all right. So here again, this router, this route, this one, and these are called directly attached. Then these two are called remote routes with respect to router one. Okay. All right, so we have what is known as the local router interfaces. Okay, what are these? These are added when an interface is configured and active. Okay, these are called interfaces. Okay, local route interfaces. Okay, now directly connected interfaces. So now this becomes a, a network. So a network is called a network. This network is called a, a directly connected interface. Okay. And then the very interface is called a local interface. So here we have 192.168.10.0. This is called a directly connected network. And then this one here is 192.168.10.1. This one is called a local route. Okay. Static routes. Now, with static routes, so you find that um, the network admin can be able to configure these routes manually. So he goes into the global configuration mode and type in a command, IP route, followed by 10.1.1.0. And then this is a subnet mask, 255.255.255.0. And then he can either use the exit interface or he can use this one as the next hop when configuring static routes. Okay, so that is deep networking. Okay, so again, he can configure. So, so uh, what I did was, you know, uh, uh, the network had been configured this route. He can also run another command, IP route, this network, followed by either the exit interface or the next hop. So that's how you configure static route. Okay, so static route is used in a smaller network. But if you have, let's say, 50 routers, then you're supposed to use dynamic routing protocols. Okay, so these, they do, uh, you know, the, the, the routers uh, do everything uh, automatically. And here we have got two examples of dynamic routing protocols. We have EIGRP, which is Cisco's, and OSPF, which is an international standard. Okay. All right, so, um, the first dynamic protocol was RIP. Okay, now RIP had issues. Therefore, um, they released, I mean, the first one was RIP version one, then they released RIP version two. Okay, so RIP is normally used in a smaller network. But if your network is large and you are using routers, from uh, different companies, it means then you're supposed to use OSPF or you can use ISIS, okay? Now, if you have, if you are running Cisco routers, then 
the dynamic routing protocol that must use is EIGRP. But before EIGRP, we had IGRP, you know. Uh, so IGRP was replaced with EIGRP. Okay. Uh, a quick, a small question, boss. Yes, sir. Um, so, um, OSPF, uh, mm -hmm. you can use it with different companies. Um, OSP, OSPF, you can use it when you're using uh, routers from different companies. Okay. Uh, in yeah. terms of when you mean different companies, if let's say another company has an, another no, 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 infrastructure. No, no, no. no, no, no. Um, when you are using routers from different manufacturers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not vendor dependent. Is not okay. Yeah, it's, right. not. So, it's not. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Good evening. Hello. Yes, sir. Good evening. 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 Sir, I would like just to represent me the notes because I'm behind. I I can't get you clearly, Mr. Chomba. What are you trying to say? I'm, I'm saying I would like just to forward me some notes sir, because I'm kind. Oh, um, you see, I I gave out the the offline material. In fact, I'm going to forward you the offline material. Right? But the thing is, the, the offline material. Uh, you know, uh, what they did is they, they added some stuff to the new material. So make sure you can, uh, if you don't have bundles, you can use the offline material. Okay. So I'd like to, I'd like you to send me some, um, no, it's not that I write what was the exam. Yeah, yeah. Now, now listen, yeah, I'll send you the offline materials. But listen to what I'm saying. The, the online materials were updated somehow. So you see, when you don't have bundles, you can study the offline material. But when you're about to write the chapter exam, make sure that you also go through the online material. Okay? All right. Uh, yes, sir. Um, right. right now, I'm going to go home. So, I'm not going to go home. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. Anyway, anyway I'll, I'll give you a call, no problem. After the lecture, I'll give you a call. I, I can't get you clearly. I'll give you a call. All right. Now, dynamic routing protocols are divided into two categories. We have interior gateway, uh, into interior gateway protocols. What are these? An example I can give here is, you know, uh, Zamtel or iConnect. So within Zamtel, the routing protocols that, are, that they use are called interior. Okay, so these interior protocols, they are further divided into distance vector and link state. Okay, so distance vector, we have RIP version 2, EIGRP, RIP next generation, and EIGRP for IPv6. Okay, then link state. We have OSPF version two and OSPF version three. So if you if you check here, you can see that OSPF version two works with IPv4, while OSPF version three works with IPv6. Okay. All right. So now we have Zamtel and iConnect. 
these are, you know, two separate autonomous systems. When you want to join two separate autonomous systems, the protocol that you use there is called exterior gateway. And we only have one, which is BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. So we have BGP4, which works for IPv4, and BGP MP, which works for IPv6. Okay. So the interior gateway protocols, they are used within an autonomous system. Let's say within Zamtel. Let's say within uh, 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 um, Airtel. But when these two separate autonomous systems, let's say Zamtel and Airtel, they want to communicate, they use an exterior gateway protocol. Okay. All right. Okay. So end-to-end -end, uh, packet uh, forwarding. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the primary responsibility of packet forwarding function is to encapsulate packets in the appropriate data link uh, uh, frame type for the outgoing interface. Okay, so the thing here is, is that, you know, when you are sending something from PC1 uh, to PC2, okay, so you see what we have, uh, uh, we have first of all the destination mark, okay? In this case, the destination mark, like what you learned last time, has to be the, the, the MAC address of the router, okay? And then, of course, we have the type which deals with the protocol that we're dealing with, okay? And then you can see a source IP. This is the source IP, okay? And then we have the destination what? The destination IP address here, okay? Uh, and the actual data which has to be uh, uh, transmitted, okay? I did explain uh, earlier on what happens when we are moving amongst these uh, routers, okay? All right. So apart from uh, those devices, neighboring devices, we also have the hub, but uh, you know, we no longer use the hub. Because the thing is, when the hub receives information, what it does is to amplify the information and send it to all the ports, okay? So, you know, whatever the hub receives, it broadcasts. So this, you know, that used to make the network to be very, very slow, okay? And when you have a network with hubs, you can separate that network by using the bridge, okay? So advances in technologies were made whereby the hub was replaced with a switch, okay? Now, the switch is very, very intelligent, okay? Because when the switch receives information, you know, it forwards that information to the appropriate port. Okay. Uh, the switch only broadcasts the, the information in a situation whereby maybe the destination address is not known. Okay. So we used to have a number of collisions uh, with the hub. That is, you know, uh, let's say uh, the messages colliding. And once the messages do collide, that message becomes, uh, you know, it will be destroyed. You know? uh, the thing is, we have what is known as a collision domain. And a hub only has one collision domain. And because of that, it has a number of collisions. On a switch, each port is a collision domain. Therefore, we rarely have collisions uh, on a switch, and therefore, the switch makes the network to be very, very fast. Okay. All right. So now, 
you have bought a brand new switch. What happens? So when you, when you start connecting the, the computers, what happens is that the switch start learning the MAC addresses of the computers that are attached to that switch. Okay. And it keeps that information in the MAC address table or what is known as the content addressable memory, the CAMP table. Okay. So this is an example here. You have the brand new switch. You have connected PC A. Okay. So this is port one. All right. So the switch is going to, you know, uh, indicate port one and the MAC address it has learned through this port. This is the reason why when the switch receives information, it is able to know where to forward the information. Okay. So this is just the, the same process. So when it comes to B, again, the switch will learn the MAC address of, of B and keep that information uh, in the MAC table until the, the table is full. Okay. All right. Still talking about uh, switches, we have a concept called VLANs or virtual lens. So here, what happens is with virtual lens, you can have a single switch. Okay. To that single switch, you connect the computers of students and the computers of lecturers. All right. Now, it is very, very important to separate, you know, the computers of lecturers from the computers of students. So what you do is you create uh, virtual local area networks. So once you have done this, me meaning you are going to have a separate network for students and a separate network for lecturers. These two cannot communicate. But if you want them to communicate, then you can do that through a router. You know, we call it a router on a stick. Okay. So you can see here that is on this switch, we can create, we, we can have VLAN 2 and name it as IT. We can also have VLAN 3 and name it as HR. We can also have VLAN 4 and name it as cells. Okay. So this is, is just like a separate local area network from this and from this. Okay. So that's the concept of uh, VLANs. So when you have got a broadcast in VLAN 2, that broadcast will remain in VLAN 2. You know, it won't go to other VLANs. So that's the concept behind virtual lens. Now, uh, spanning tree protocol. So you see, uh, in the organization, it is very, very important that you have what is known as redundancy. That is, instead of having one switch, you can have two switches such that when one switch goes down, the other switch will continue functioning. You know, which is very, very important. But when we have redundancy, we create uh, another problem, which is called uh, the loops. What is a loop? So you see, we are dealing with switches and therefore here we're dealing with frames. So you find that something can happen to a frame and that frame will keep on moving from one switch to the other, from one PC to the other, and it creates a loop. Okay. How do we overcome that problem? Let me just see if, if there's any diagram here or that there isn't. Okay. 
Let me just check if uh, oh, there, there isn't. All right. Now, how do we avoid the loops? Okay. We configure what is known as spanning tree. And how does spanning tree works? So with spanning tree, first of all, the switches are going to exchange the messages known as the BPDUs. While they are sending these, these, these messages, they have to elect one switch to be the root, to be the root bridge. Once they have done that, then those switches, they are going to block one port. Once one port is blocked, it means that then we won't have the loops. Okay. Now, that port, it will be listening to the messages. If the current link that we are using goes down, the blocked link comes up. Okay. That's how spanning tree works. Okay. So quite all right. Yes, on layer two, we need redundancy. We need two switches, very, very important, such that when this switch goes down, that switch has to continue functioning. Okay, but by doing that, again, we create another problem which is called the loop. But we are able to overcome this problem of loops by using what is known as the spanning tree uh, protocol. Okay, all right, so um, the switches are called layer two devices, but now we have also uh, layer three switches. These are switches which are able to perform both switching and routing. Okay, we call them mount layer switches. And they have what is known as the routed port, which is just a pure layer three interface you know, similar to a physical interface on the Cisco router. Again, we can also configure what is known as the switch virtual interface for managing layer three uh, 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 switches. Okay, so this is how layer three uh, switches uh, looks like. Okay, this one is a layer two uh, switch. So you can see here, we can be able to create these two VLANs on this switch. Once we have done that, it means this would be a separate network and this also be totally a separate network. Okay. But if we want the computers which are in VLAN 10 to communicate with the computers which are in VLAN 20, we need to involve the router. It means the PC has to go through the router like that. But with the introduction of layer th three switches, they have made this process to be faster. So what is recommended is in place of using the router, it is very, very important that we use a layer three switch because it makes the process to be faster. Okay. All right, wireless communications. Um, this is uh, very, very uh, uh, important in our age. Um, the goodness with uh, wireless, you find that um, the, the cost of setting up a network is not all that huge because you do not need uh, cables. What you need is just radio uh, frequency. So uh, wireless falls under a standard code 802.11, okay? So you can see here how the wireless LAN differed from the, wire, from the wired LAN, okay? Um, the thing is, the wireless LAN is just an extension of a LAN because in a, wire, in a wireless LAN, 
we have what are known as the access points, okay? So these are the devices which are able to send the signal through the, the air, okay? So with wireless lens, we have access points, okay? While on wired lens, we have the switches, okay? With wireless lens, of course, we, we use mobile devices, which is not the case with the wired network. And with wireless lens, of course, we have to use the frequency bands, okay? Right. And when it comes to the frames, wireless lens use dif uh, a, a different uh, frame format to the wired Ethernet lens. Okay. Now, in terms of security, we know wireless raises more privacy issues because whatever we are transmitting, we do it through the air. Okay. So here we have characteristics. Here we have the wireless lane. This is the wired. Okay, in terms of the physical layer, for the wireless, we use radio frequency. While for the wired, we use the cables. Okay. Now, uh, for media access, with wireless, we use carrier sense, multiple access, collision avoidance. While on wired, we use carrier sense, multiple access, collision detection. So, what is this? So in a wired network, before a device sends something, it has to listen to the network to find out whether someone is sending or not. Okay? All right. Uh, in terms of availability, for, for wireless, this depends on the range of the signal. Okay. For the wired, of course, we need the cable. Signal interference, of course, we have it uh, in wireless, while in wired, it is minimal. In terms of regulations, with wireless lane, of course, uh, uh, we have regulators uh, that, have, that, that, that have to be involved, while with wired, we have IEEE, which is in charge. Okay, so this is the frame of a wireless LAN. So you can see in the header here, we have three addresses. Okay, the frame con uh, control, duration, sequence control, and then the fourth uh, address. This is the payload, the actual information that has, has to be transmitted. This is the FCS to check for errors uh, in the frame. Okay. All right. So I talked about, uh, you know, carrier sense, multiple access, collision avoidance. Uh, this is uh, 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 the one which wireless uh, 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 uses. So before a wireless device sends something, of course, it also has to make sure that no any other device is sending. Otherwise, if both are going to send at the same time, then we're going to have the collision. Okay. So um, these wireless, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, devices, they use what is known as ready to send. Okay. Uh, uh, they do send a message called ready to send. And if they do receive a message called clear to send, that's when uh, your mobile phone or, or your laptop sends something over the air. Okay. All right. So what we have, this is your laptop. Definitely we must have the access point, okay? So your laptop, first of all, has to discover the access point 
and then they have to authenticate. After authentication, then they have to associate, okay? That is the process which is involved. Now, when configuring the access point, you must configure what is known as the SSID. This is the network name. And then also you must configure the, the password, okay? And then the network modes. So here we have got different modes because we had different standards, okay? And then of course, the security mode. And the one which is recommended at the moment has to be WPA2 because WEP was cracked and WPA was cracked. So make sure that you choose WPA2, okay? Channel setting, this is very, very important. So when you have more than one access point, okay, and you're using band 2.5, it means, for example, one access point has to be on channel one. The other one has to be on channel six. Be because if you put it on channel three, then these two access points are going to overlap. You know, you're going to have uh, interference. Okay. So the, the, the discover mode that we have, we have got two types of discover modes. We have uh, passive and uh, uh, active. So uh, in the passive mode, in this mode, the access point openly advertises its services by sending the beacons, okay? So in the passive mode, it is the access point looking for the clients. So it sends the message known as the beacons, okay? And what do we have in the beacon? We have the SSID, the standards that have to be supported, as well as security settings, okay? In the active mode, it is the access point, I mean, it is, it is your laptop, which has to look for the access point. So your machine sends messages called the probes, okay? So it will send the probe request, and what we have in the probe request uh, is the SSID as well as the supported standard. Wireless devices. So for you to have a wireless network, you must have the access point, okay? And then uh, you, you must have uh, the lightweight wireless access point. And then also you must have the wireless, uh, the wireless controller. So you see, um, if your organization is very, very small, then you can have maybe two or three access points. But if your organization is very, very big, maybe you can have 100 uh, access points. So in that situation, you would need the wireless controller, okay? Because it will be the wireless controller which will be sending the configurations to those access points. Okay, all right. All right, so that is that uh, on, our, um, on our module 11. From there, let us look at uh, mod module uh, 12, which is uh, network security infrastructure. So, you know, we have just completed looking at networking. Uh, very, very important that, you know, you must have that uh, knowledge. Okay. Network security infrastructure. So the module objective here is to explain how devices and services are used to enhance network security, okay? 
So we have network topologies. So this deals with how the devices are connected. Okay. As I said, we have end devices. These are examples of end devices. And then these are examples of intermediary devices. And for us to have a network, these must be uh, uh, connected either by using wireless media, okay, LAN media, or WAN media. Okay. We have two types of topologies. We have the physical topology. This is very, very important. Okay. You must have the topology. That is how the devices are connected such that when you employ a new network admin, you'll be able to know where you know, things are. So this is the physical topology where you have the devices you know, and they are named. This is the logical topology where you have the devices, they are named, but apart, but apart from that, we also have the port numbers that have to be indicated. Networks, of course, they come in, in so many sizes. We have a small uh, home uh, uh, network where you have three or four computers. And then we have a uh, um, small office, home office, maybe where you have, uh, you know, uh, 10 computers or 15. And then you have medium or large network, maybe where you have, um, hundreds of, of computers. And then we have the worldwide. This is the internet, which is the network of networks. Okay. So we have the local area networks, which we have to connect. And then we have the WANs, which we have to connect. And in the end, we have what is known as the internet. Okay. So I did explain about this. So this is a local area network. This is another local area network, okay? To join these two, make sure you have to use the router. The network between the routers is called a wide area network. Okay, all right. So uh, you see, this is a local area network, okay? Then this network here is called a WAN a wide area network. It connects two different what? Local area networks. Okay. All right. Now, um, when setting up a network, you don't just wake up and start connecting stuff. They are design models that you follow, okay? And Cisco uses what is known as a hierarchical uh, model. A, a, a hierarchical model is one with layers. So we have the access layer, okay? Why using this model? Because it will be easy, it will be easier to expand the network without affecting its performance. And also you can implement security on each and every layer. So in the access layer, this is where we connect the end devices, okay? And then uh, when we have different local area networks, we connect those at the distribution layer. And then we have the core layer. This is where we connect to the internet or we connect to, uh, you know, we connect other branches, okay? So these devices that we have here must be very, very powerful, you know, because, you know, they handle a large amount of data, okay? All right, so we can have we can use either this uh, model where we have got three layers, or if we don't have resources, then we can combine 
the access layer and the and distribution layer, we form what is known as the collapsed core. Okay. All right. So you see, you have read, you didn't understand, make sure you can be able to pray this video, you know, and you get some more concepts. Okay. All right. So just like with networking, in security, you don't just wake up and start putting up uh, firewalls here and there. We have some common security architectures that have to be followed. Okay. So we have what is known as the, the, the public and private. Okay. So this will be the untrust zone. And then this will be the trust zone, whereby you can set up policies saying any traffic coming from here, trying to enter into our network has to be denied. But anything coming from the private network can be allowed. Okay. Or we can have this model where we have the private network the public network and the DMZ, okay? So in the DMZ as the organization, this is where you put the servers which will be accessible to the public. So you configure the policies here, saying you're going to allow traffic from the public going to the DMZ. And then, Anything coming from the DMZ trying to go to a private network has to be denied. And then anything again coming from the public trying to go to the private network has to be denied. Okay, so you can learn how to configure those uh, policies uh, in uh, uh, CCNA, uh, you know, uh, security, which will be called um, uh, computer network security, you know. Um, at the moment, um, uh, they halted that program. They're trying to, to make some changes uh, here and there. So it is in that course where you learn how to configure the firewalls, okay? Or if you want, you can implement what is known as zone-based uh, policy firewalls, okay? So where you can have this as a private zone, you know, you have the private zone and another private zone, you know? So between these private zones, you set no restrictions. They can be able to communicate without any restrictions, okay? But anything coming from the DMZ trying to, you know, trying to get to the private lens has to be denied. Okay. That's how you, you do it. Okay. And I think we have done a lot uh, uh, for today. Um, we are going to continue with uh, security devices. That is uh, next week, Tuesday. Because uh, come Monday, we are going to do uh, uh, hands-on uh, labs. Okay. Um, do you have questions on what we have talked about today? All right. Anyway, uh, thanks once more for attending. I really appreciate and I'll see you uh, next week.